Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Laura and this and the place. So now that I've got my very, very, very cringy intro over and done with, I'm going to get straight into today's video, which is part one of my best books of the year. Um, I narrowed it down to a total of 13 books. So I'm going to be talking to you about numbers six to 13 today. And I will catch you up with the very top, the very best, the top five in another video. Um, so let's get straight into position number 13, which goes to the grower of the year. So this goes to a book that I initially read and was a little bit disappointed with because it wasn't really what I was expecting it to be. Um, but throughout the year, I've not really been able to stop thinking about it. And I have come to the point of realising now that actually it's a pretty good book and I did really like it. Um, and that book is The Tunnel by Ernesto Sabato. Um, now, in this book, we are following our main character, Juan Pablo Castell, who is a painter in South America and is recollecting um, what led him to commit a murder from prison. And we learn pretty early on in the book that the person that he murdered was his lover, um, whom was someone that he thought he had a really deep personal connection with and met when she was kind of gazing at one of his paintings at an art exhibition and he becomes infatuated with her and sort of decides that she is his, is like his soulmate um, from the word go. And they do indeed have a relationship, but for reasons to the fault of both of them, it doesn't work out. And um, we know from... <laughs> Although um, Castell is a very unreliable narrator, I mean, he's a he's a murderer telling his story in prison, constantly quite outwardly admitting that he committed this murder, but equally distancing himself from it and removing the guilt and blame from his own person. And we see that he has quite an unstable personality. He's not able to connect with other people and he feels very isolated and that Maria who was his lover, was kind of his ticket to being a part of humanity and feeling less alone. Um, what I really like about this is, number one, I love, I absolutely adore um, an unreliable narrator narrative. Um, I think it's so interesting to see the way in which people can deliberately and subconsciously reconstruct their realities to fit with what is most acceptable to themselves. Um, the way in which they deviously lie and just kind of unpicking what's going on. Um, and I love sort of the mystery of trying to delve in and find the truth, um, but also seeing that there are different versions of the truth for different people. So what I really like about this is it almost acts as a satire of a traditional detective novel. And um, Castell kind of um, picks up the traits of what you might expect from a detective in one of these novels and has these long deductive mon monologues where he's picking up all these random disparate, disparate clues and piecing them together to a conclusion, um, which kind of always um, distances himself from the blame and the fatal nature of his relationship with Maria. Um, and in fact, all of the clues that he picks up, sometimes like in a sort of classic trashy detective novel, are completely arbitrary and the way in which he fits them together truly don't make sense. Um, but it's very interesting and kind of almost funny to realise that Castell is doing this and to sort of look at the reasons why he's doing it. Um, there's also a really, really lovely part in this, well, I say lovely, this is a really great passage in this book where we find out why it's called the tunnel, where we have this really detailed imagery of how Castell has always felt through his life, as though he's in a tunnel and he's sort of De um, journey or destiny has been predetermined but he's also been isolated and underground and trapped um, and he when he saw Maria he thought that he had seen someone who was also in the same situation as him and could relate and could join him and make him feel less alone but that ultimately at his darkest moment when he realises this relationship isn't going anywhere and doesn't mean anything um, and that he realises that he is he is in this tunnel, but she's not in there with him. And she's kind of looking in from the outside. And yeah, I just thought it was really powerfully showing um, the way in which it feels to be completely disconnected from everybody else in society, to be different, to feel isolated. And the depth of like longing for human connection and the importance of connecting with 
with um, the rest of your community and with other people. And also what was really fun about this, I thought, was that the imagery so much echoed um, the film Us, which came out a couple of years ago, I think, and I had watched around a similar time. And I was just struck by how uncanny the similarity between this passage about the tunnel is with the kind of idea of parallel lives in that film. I don't want to go into it too much because I don't want to spoil it. But if you have watched this film, um, I would really love it if you could have a look at this book and tell me if you if you get it, because I was just kind of in a sense, the um, fact that I don't think anyone's ever referenced this book in connection with that film kind of made it so much more spooky and sort of interesting and uh, convincing that you had this kind of um, similarity between the two um, different pieces of work that were kind of gunning towards a similar theme. But yeah, so I really, really, really love this. And the more I think about it, the more I think this is an excellent book and I would highly recommend you to pick it up. So in position number 12, we have the most terrifying or scariest book of 2020 for me. And that might not be a surprise to many of you. I think this has been going around a lot this year and it has got high praise from so, so, so many people. So I don't think you really need me to harp on about it too much. Um, but that book is I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. Oh, there we are. That's better. We're following a young couple who are going to visit the boyfriend's parents for the first time and um, despite kind of agreeing to go on this journey the girlfriend has been for some time and for the duration of the journey continues to think about ending their relationship and that's basically the whole sort of setup for what goes on and we kind of see her discussions with her boyfriend but also her recollection of things that have been on her mind and what she's thinking about during the trip um and this is probably not like going to be one of my all-time favorite books forever just because like a, a thriller doesn't usually have that kind of longevity for me but I couldn't sort of talk about my best books of the year without mentioning this because it is such a skillfully written book I was absolutely amazed with how brilliantly Ian Reid manages to build this tension in this book and keep you so sucked in and um like it was so scary I I was actually genuinely scared I don't find any book scary ever to be honest like I just kind of always maintain this sort of sense of detachment from them but this I was so involved I was so worried and stressed and scared for the people in this book um yeah, it was genuinely like watching a film for me, which is kind of a medium that I find affects me more in my in my fear stimuli. Um, but yeah, I they that I was just absolutely gobsmacked. I was thinking for days like, oh my god, how did he do this? How did he make something so scary and so impactful? It is such a powerful book. Um, so I would really, really recommend reading this just for the experience of giving yourself a fright. The award for number eleven goes to the book. That is most for me. Um, now, <laughs> that book is Mother, Brother, Lover by Jarvis Cocker. Um, this is just like a collection of pulp and Jarvis Cocker solo work lyrics. And then at the end, there are some notes and annotations on the lyrics contained in here. Um, I've wanted this book for so many years because I am absolutely obsessed with Jarvis and pulp. Like, I absolutely stand them, they're my ride or die, like I don't know what I would have done without listening, um, without listening to Pulp and Jarvis on my Spotify wrapped every single year of my life and I imagine they will be forever, um, so yeah, <laughs> this is the most for me because it's just kind of like a very random recommend, well, it's a random and specialised recommendation that makes it just perfect for me, um, yeah. I have read this pretty much as soon as I got it. Um, it's kind of fun just to keep going back to and pick up and sort of maybe as you've just listened to a different track to go and see what the notes are about again. Um, the notes kind of differ or vary between general notes on sort of cultural context, which mostly I'm already aware of um, living in the UK. Um, and then sometimes Jarvis talks about what inspired him to write a particular song like um, I was surprised A Little Girl With Blue Eyes, which is one of my favourite ones, was inspired by a photograph of his mother who actually has hazel eyes. So yeah, just kind of fun random facts like that, that are only probably going to appeal to somebody who loves Pulp and Jarvis. But if you do and you haven't got this, 
it is a pretty fun thing to have i would recommend though don't expect too much like there's not like it's not detailed um annotations it's usually like half a page per a song um you can't really see and sometimes it's literally just like explaining what the milk tray is referencing or like who the bad comedian is sorry i've got razzmatazz in my head but um yeah so just be aware that it's not like in depth storytelling about the songs it's kind of just random and ad hoc but it's still very fun as always to be in jarvis's mind a little bit now in position number 10 we have a prize that sounds slightly bitchy but i promise it's not so for position number 10 it's the technically worst of the top 10. now the reason that i've given this place to the well of loneliness is because i think most people who read this would agree that radcliffe hall is not an amazing writer she does fine but like she's not the next best thing well this is a very old book but like she's not super talented like this like you wouldn't say this is one of the best books of all time um it's not very literary let's say and beyond that as well people do often critique it for the way in which it treats certain issues such as class gender um and just generally lgbtq plus um issues however i think that you have to kind of take it out with a pinch of salt and remember that this was written in 1928 um so that being said, let's talk about what this book is about. Um, so in this book, we are following Stephen, who is the daughter of a very wealthy family. I think they live in the Midlands. I can't quite remember. Um, and the, her parents thought when, when they were pregnant that they were going to have a son and they ended up having a daughter, but they called her Stephen anyway. Um, and as Stephen grows up, she always isn't doesn't really fit in with the way in which you people at the time would have expected a woman to behave she always has this kind of desire to like do boyish things to be a boy to dress like a boy um she kind of has these different sort of desires or relationships with the women in her life um and whilst her father is very supportive of it because he loves her and he doesn't sort of see any harm coming from what she's doing and he kind of respects that that's just who she is um it's things are slightly more difficult with her mother and obviously she kind of struggles throughout the book to come to terms and understand what or who she is and to deal with the way in which society treats her and she has romances which ultimately always end in tragedy um and she wants to become a writer and she kind of is told by somebody else in her life that she has in order to be accepted by society as a lesbian or note on that um or as somebody who's queer or different that she has to prove herself um by being this great writer and being respected for other things so she's sort of jostling with that and then in world war one she's really upset because she can't get involved in um supporting or her country in the same way that the other men can particularly um she gets is hurt by the fact that um homosexual men who are normally sort of pushed aside and stigmatized were accepted into the army where she couldn't be um so we sort of follow multiple episodes in her life where she's struggling with her identity and the way in which society treats her the reason this is one of my favorites despite being um not the most literary book ever or like stunningly written or what have you is that it makes such an important point that i think some people do still need to realize that which is that um we need to have a space in society for all people to be able to exist and to be seen like it's one thing kind of not bothering with like not minding but just you don't want to see it everywhere but it's so important to have a place for for people to exist in society who are not heteronormative, not heterosexual, um, because to not have a place to exist means to not to not be able to exist, to not be able to be yourself and to not be able to live. And it has these sort of absolutely dramatically tragic um, outcomes when people are denied the right to have a place and be seen in society, because to kind of to be seen is to, to exist and to be. Um, and yeah, I just think that that is a very important thing that people need to grasp, whether it's because of somebody's religion, somebody's um, sexuality, um, just the way somebody likes to be, somebody's race, 
anything about somebody it doesn't it doesn't matter everybody has a right to be seen and a right to exist and a right to live and I think this book very specifically looks at that kind of aspect of things like the what is required to be able to live your life actually you need a lot more than just being tolerated you need to be able to be seen to prosper and live your life for other people to also do the same and to understand who they are now on to what i said like a note about whether or not she's a lesbian this is described on the back as um a landmark work of lesbian fiction so my only qualm with that is that although radcliffe hall was a lesbian in the sense that her partner in life was a woman i think it's very very difficult to kind of qualify what this is in terms of where it would sit in sort of lgbtq plus because it's still unclear even from reading this book where exactly stephen sits within that whether they might be trans um they might be non-binary they might be gender fluid they might just be a woman and a lesbian it's very difficult to identify that from reading it but also part of that is because this was written in 1928 when the same sort of I don't want to say categories but the sort of identifiers were not the same like it's very difficult to um, consolidate our kind of current ideas about gender and sexuality with what's in this book so I would caution you about viewing this as lesbian fiction I'd kind of just categorize it broadly as queer or LGBTQ plus um, and another thing to talk about is obviously i mentioned earlier that many people have criticized this for the way in which um stephen acts as somebody of her class towards lower class people um and also the way in which she kind of perpetuates kind of self-hate for her sexuality and also the way in which she is quite slanderous and nasty about homosexual men in this book which kind of comes out of jealousy almost um and i would say that number one you have to remember this was written in 1928 um things were different it wasn't people didn't sort of act within the parameters that we do now or that we wish for now and you also have to remember that this is not this is not presenting us with a goal society this is if anything like a cautionary tale on not how to do things and how things shouldn't be so i think that you can kind of isolate it from the sort of negative aspects of the book and just remember that that's not what it's really trying to do so in position number nine we have the best friend of a novel and this goes to the book that both looks at friendship in a lot of detail and also is so warming and autumnal and cosy that it felt like a nice supportive friend to have when I was reading it and that book is Crossing to Safety by Wallace Stegner. Um, now this book is told retrospectively which as you might realise now is kind of one of my favourite things. I love I love things that explore memory and the way in which memory is distorted and shifts um, and just kind of the beauty of memory. Actually, almost every book in here is kind of to do with memory, which is weird. But yes, I guess every story is in memory. But anyway, um, so yes, this is told retrospe retrospectively when all of the people in this friendship, so the four people are all kind of in their 70s, I think. Um, and something has happened which has brought them all back together after many years apart but their friendship is still endured um, and they first meet I think when they're in their 20s both of the husbands are academics and they both work at the same college and their wives are both pregnant and that sparks this really lovely friendship between them well sometimes lovely sometimes not um, yes and it's obviously set in the depression as I said and it's kind of interesting to see the perspective of academics during that time as I think we're mostly used to sort of like um, in the Dust Bowl and um, agricultural labour workers. Um, so yes, that was interesting. And one of the couples is very privileged and um, the other couple um, has to actually work in order to survive and has a very difficult time of it. And the husbands sort of have this thing where they're both trying to be successful in sort of English academia. Um, and for different reasons whether it's for other people's expectations their own enjoyment pride or literally just as a means to live yes um so what i love about this book is that as i've said it's so warm and cozy the descriptions of the landscape completely draw you in and you can you can smell it you can feel it um you can particularly feel the emotion associated with a place um and 
friendship and scenery and awesome are very very deeply intertwined like um the landscape does quite often feel like a personification of the friendship between these people so yes as well it's really nice to kind of read from the perspective of someone who's like an older man and sort of get his take on friendship what is important in life and what you expect to get from life when you're sort of in your 20s and what really happens and the way in which fate and unexpected forces or events kind of prevent you from doing exactly what you thought or expected or hoped for um yes um and i guess i would say well i obviously put this in position number nine and this is kind of exactly the kind of setup or um for a book that i would love and the only reason that it didn't kind of get higher up for me is just because i like to be absolutely destroyed like i want my soul to be crumbling to pieces at the end of a book like this and i just didn't quite get there um which i think is because unfortunately the female characters were harder to connect with i don't feel like they had enough substance or enough variety to them um, to kind of really suck me in. In position number eight we have the most magically slump breaking and I have to kind of make a note here that I wasn't actually in a reading slump when I read this but I think it would be great for anyone who is in a reading slump but also I was kind of like in a head fog. It was the end of the year I was kind of like dipping in and out of the multiple books that I'd started not finished and I was very stressed I couldn't focus on anything and this kind of centered me again and just had me so excited for a whole year's worth of reading in 2021 and that book was Weights and Measures by Joseph Roth. So Anselm is persuaded by his wife to move from his life as a soldier to take a civilian post near the Russian border and he gets given the job of being a weights and measures inspector which involves going around the various sort of markets and shops in the town or the area that he lives in and checking that they're not using counterfeit weights or measures. Obviously everybody is um, and to start with, he kind of sort of meanders around. He's very much not quite a job's worth, but he does everything as it should be done. Like he's a military man, he's very disciplined, but also he's not beyond exercising compassion and he doesn't really, although he, he does his job, he doesn't persecute people unnecessarily. Um, however, as he as time goes by he feels very isolated in the society in this new community um it's not what he's used to he doesn't feel at home there um it wasn't what he wanted it wasn't his choice to move there either um and all of this kind of unmoors him and makes him feel very isolated and unsatisfied and he sort of builds up this hatred towards his wife who made him move there um, and then on top of this the sort of corruption of those around him including his wife Kind of pushes him into his own sort of corruption and someone who starts off as a very good disciplined man falls into bad stuff and he steadily becomes more and more corrupted until tragedy ensues um and yeah it's very it's a very short story it's interesting to see the decline of this man um but it's sort of was more the writing style and the sort of fable or folkloric quality of it that kind of had me kind of entranced and really interested in this because it's quite a basic story if you know what I mean um but everything is told with sort of this sense of magic and all of these mundane things are told in quite a lot of detail and as I said sort of everything kind of has a sparkle to it a luster um which is really nice and really sort of dragged me in and made me feel like I wanted to read like some big Russian tomes, I don't know, and be in sort of a cold, wintry place where everything is sort of, I don't know, like a, a fairy tale winter wonderland. I don't know. I don't know what I wanted, but it just gave me that kind of vibe, if you know what I mean, and just made me so excited to read some more stuff because I was just enjoying it so much and was really taken by the writing. Um, but beyond that, I'd say one of the most interesting parts of this book is the way that it looks at agency of this person because obviously he starts off as a good man and is corrupted by the people around him and the choices of people around him but beyond that there's also this weird sort of um, mirroring between the environment and um, the individual and his actions in that the sort of um, the coming of the seasons the stars, the birds, the creatures, the land all kind of mirror the way in which our main character is feeling and behaving 
and it sort of makes you wonder where the causality lies like is is the environment um impacted by our protagonist Ansel's Ansel's um actions or is it vice versa and everything almost tying into sort of the magical ethereal kind of val um, value to the writing it makes everything sort of feel like a set like you feel like you're in a movie set um and there's a point at which a woman as well is sort of described as um like a flower in a vase seated at a table rather than sort of on it and it makes you feel like everybody is kind of like a counter um or an actor in this sort of play in this larger kind of i don't know it's really weird but like it just feels like it is really looking at agency and who has a choice in what they do and are you just kind of like a, a pawn or like a, a side character in somebody else's show and is someone controlling you i just i was really really taken in by that kind of impression more than the story itself um so i would really really recommend that in position number seven we have the tiniest book that i loved and that book could only be john berger's the red tender of bologna now i don't frequently like these kind of very tiny books however i absolutely love this um it was so emotive and so powerfully written. So in this book, Berger is um, on a trip to Bologna and he's reflecting on what he sees and feels and remembers on that trip. But also more than that, it's all kind of centred around and anchored by the memory of his uncle who passed away. Um, his uncle seemed to be quite an eccentric character and I think like had very tender, um, had a very tender relationship with Bologna and they had a very assured strong relationship and friendship between them which makes this a very very touching and moving book it feels very um, melancholy and contemplative and soft and it feels like it just feels like love um and yeah so i don't really know what more can you say about it but it, yeah it's just the most beautiful exploration of memory and connection and love and love lost the sort of tenderness of their relationship in the way that berger remembers it is just so heartwarming and so emotional and i'm sure most people will read this and although it's about Berger's uncle you'll read somebody close to you in it um which is what i really liked about it time will tell he used to say and he said this in such a way that i assumed time would tell what we'd both be finally glad to hear i mean i just love it uh, so it's it's written in lots of little vignettes and it's not really got like a linear line through it. It kind of flits around like a memory, like when you're speaking about something and then you remember something else and then that reminds you of that and then you go back and then forth. It feels very natural, like a journey through somebody's mind and memory or almost like an oral sort of thing that might be just spilling out of you. So yeah, it feels very impassioned and very natural and just is so compelling. I would really recommend, it's such a short little tiny thing. Um, I don't think you'll be disappointed by this. So I'm about to go on to the last book I'm going to talk about in today's video and that is place number six which goes to the most debilitating book that I read. Now I'm just going to give you a minute to think about what it might be. I know everybody's going to instantly go it's a little life isn't it? Um, it's not a little life because I am still too scared to read that. I definitely want to read it in 2021 but I just don't know when's going to be the right time. I'm I'm nervous <laughs> especially after reading this which I really wasn't expecting to have the impact on me that it did I'm worried about a little life um so yes position number six goes to The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath I'd been meaning to read this for years but I was kind of always a little bit unsure of what it was actually about um so in this book we're following Esther who is a intern at a fashion magazine in New York and she's just kind of done with school and like college or whatever and she's used to always having some of something to drive towards and sort of the milestone set out of what you do next with your life she's used to just being successful and succeeding within those parameters that sort of world she had figured out and obviously she's just left and her whole life is ahead of her she's got all of these choices to make um and and yeah sort of everything opportunity and life sits in her hands and we are sort of with her in New York as she's finishing off her internship and the encounters she has. We're following her with sort of her love interests and like men that she meets and the way that she responds to them and what she expects from them and how they make her feel. 
um, and then we see her sort of returning home and experiencing what her mum's expectations and recommendations for her life are and she ultimately sort of falls out of all of these experiences into a like a into a depression and um, we follow her in a mental health institution as well um, and in her time there um, so yeah it's it's quite a well it told me honest it's just quite a book Esther is a very relatable character like everything that she faces well much of it is exactly the same as what a young person will face today and that's what's kind of so affecting and unmooring and debilitating about this book is that it is so real like this is a reality for lots of people probably and it could be a reality for even more um it's just so easy to connect with Esther um not only that but the writing style Sylvia Plath just writes amazingly it is so so compelling um and also the way that she sort of picks up these kind of feminist critiques of the way women in her life are treated, um, the way men treat her and their expectations for her um, versus the way that they're able to behave. All of it, it's just so amazing. And this truly is so, like, is the most debilitating book I read. I loved it and I think it is amazing. I think it so accurately depicts the way in which you might, or many people do feel at that point in their lives. And for me, certainly, it really sort of took me back to a time that I would rather have forgotten for myself and really did sort of put me in this dark fog and really, really was upsetting, um, genuinely. Like I would, I would, I could praise this book endlessly. I think it's so amazing and I would really recommend it. It's so effective. It's so real. Um, the writing, the writing is um, beautiful. It very much sort of puts you in this place. But I would I would sort of strongly say that this does have some trigger warnings. Like if you think that this is something that might be affect like it might affect you, I would very much caution you to read it at a time when your mental health will be able to cope with it. I don't know if lockdowns and generally just the situation we're still in is the best time for reading this. If if you feel strong enough, please do. But just just keep that in mind because when I say debilitating, it's half a joke, but halfly half of it is very serious this was absolutely soul destroying so yes that is book 6 to 13 in my best books of 2020 um let me know if you've read any of these and you also enjoyed them or if you're thinking of reading any of them now i'd also love to hear your top books of the year um and i wonder if you can predict any of my top 5 i really strongly doubt that you will because it's quite a random selection I have to say um so yes if you've enjoyed this video please hang around and look out for my next one which will be part two of my top five books of the year um so thank you so much for watching I hope you've enjoyed it and I will see you again soon bye bye